Hi. Um, hi. I am so excited to be here with you. We're so excited to be here tonight. And um, I think we should just jump right into it with you giving us a taste of sweet bitter. Alrighty. That's <laughs> what I'm here to do. Um, so sweet bitter follows a year in the life of a young woman who works in a restaurant. Early in the novel, um, we see her get the job and kind of fall down the rabbit hole and fall in love with that world. So I'm gonna read a scene from early, um, early in the book when she's just getting the lay of the land and starting to meet her coworkers. When I got the job, I didn't actually get the job. I got to train for the job and the position was back waiter, which wasn't the same thing as being a server. Howard led me up a narrow spiral staircase in the back of the kitchen and deposited me in the locker room. He said, you're the new girl now. You have a certain responsibility. He left without clarifying what that responsibility was. In the corner of the windowless room sat two older Latino men and a woman. They'd been speaking in Spanish, but were now staring at me. A small electric fan shuddered between them. I tried to smile. Is there somewhere I can change? Right here, mommy, the woman said. She had unruly black hair held back by a bandana. Rivlets of sweat made track marks down her face. She pursed her lips. The men with their outsized destroyed faces. Okay, I said. I opened my locker and stuck my face into it, blocking them from my sight. Howard told me to buy a white button-down shirt and I put it on over my tank top to avoid undressing. The shirt was as breathable as cardboard. Sweat ran down my back and into my underwear. They began talking again, fanning themselves, walking to a small sink and splashing water on their faces. The room was stacked with chairs in the back and along the walls were pairs of crocs and clogs covered in white splotches, heels worn down to nothing. There was no air, my chest contracted. The door burst open and a man said, are you not hungry? Are you coming? I looked at the three in the corner to make sure he was talking to me. He had an adolescent tame face but was irritated, brows narrowed together. No, I'm hungry, I said. I wasn't, I just wanted something to do. Well, family's almost over. How much more primping do you have? I shut my locker and put my hair back in a ponytail. I'm done, are you in charge of me? Yeah, I'm in charge of you, I'm your trailer. First lesson, if you miss family, you don't eat. Well, it's nice to meet you, I'm, I know who you are. He slammed the door behind us. You're the new girl, don't forget to clock in. There were tables in the back dining room set with stainless steel sheet trays and bowls so big I could bathe in them. Macaroni and cheese, fried chicken, potato salad, biscuits, an oily green salad with shredded carrots. Pitchers of iced tea. It looked like food for a large catered event, but my trailer handed me a white plate and started helping himself to family meal. He went and sat at a table in the corner without inviting me to follow. The staff had taken over the dining room. They came from every department, the servers in aprons, people in white coats, women removing headsets, men in suits, tugging at ties. I sat near the servers in the very last chair, the best seat if I needed to run. Pre-shift turned out to be a turbulent affair. A frazzled, skittish manager named Zoe was looking at me like it was my fault. She kept calling out numbers or names, things like Section 6 and Mr. Blah 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 at 8 p.m., but the servers talked right through her. I nodded deftly. I couldn't touch my food. The servers looked like actors, each perfectly idiosyncratic but rehearsed, and it all felt staged for my benefit. They wore striped shirts of every color. They were performing, snapping, clapping, kissing, cutting each other off, layers of noise colluding while I sank into my seat. Howard walked up with wine glasses hanging like spokes from his hand. A young man in a suit trailed behind him with a bottle of wine wrapped in brown paper. The servers passed around the glasses with taste, but one never made it to me. When Howard clapped his hands, everyone went silent. Who would like to begin? Someone called out, Pino, obviously. New world or old? Howard asked, scanning the room. Old world, a voice called out, obviously, someone else said. 
It's old. I mean, it's got age. Look, it's beginning to pale. Okay, so we're talking burgundy. It's just a matter of deduction now. I'm on to you. Howard waited. A little austere to be coat de bone. Is it off? I was thinking it was off. No, it's perfect. They stopped talking. I leaned forward to see who had said that. She was in the same row as me, behind too many people. I saw the bowl of her glass as she pulled it away from her nose and brought it back. Her voice, low, ponderous, continued. Cote de Nuit. Hmm, Howard, this is a treat. Gevry Chambertin, of course. The Harmon Joffrey. She put the glass down in front of her. From what I, see, what I saw, she hadn't taken a sip. The wine caught the light rebelli rebelliously. The 2000 vintage, it's actually showing really well. I agree, Simone, thank you. Howard clapped his hands again. Friends, this wine is a steal, and don't let the difficult 2000 vintage put you off. Cote Nui was able to pull off stunning wines, and they're drinking well today, right now, this minute. And as far as this gift goes, pass it along to your guests. Everyone stood up together. The people around me stacked their plates on top of my full one and left. I held them to my chest and pushed through the swinging doors in the kitchen. Two servers walked by on my right, and I heard one of them say in a false sing-song, Oh, the Harmon Joffrey, of course. And the other girl rolled her eyes. Someone walked by on my left and said, Seriously? You don't know what a dishwasher looks like? I moved toward a trough laden with dirty dishes that ran the length of the room. I set down my stack apologetically. A tiny gray-haired man on the other side of the trough huffed and took my stack, scraping the food off each one into a trash can. Pinche idiota, he said, and spat into the trough. Thank you, I said. Maybe I'd never actually made a mistake before in my life, and this is what it felt like. Like your hands were slipping off every facet, like you didn't have the words or directions, and even gravity wasn't reliable. I felt my trailer behind me and spun around to grab him. Where do I? I reached out for an arm and noticed too late it wasn't striped. It was bare. There was a static shock when I touched it. Oh, you're not my person. I looked up. Black jeans and a white t-shirt with a backpack on one shoulder. Eyes so pale, a weather-worn spectral blue. He was covered in sweat and sweating, out of breath. I inhaled sharply. My trailer, I mean, you're not him. His eyes were a vice. Are you sure? I nodded. He looked me up and down indiscreetly. What are you? He asked. I'm new. Jake. We both turned. The woman who knew the wine stood in the doorway. She didn't even see me. Her gaze distilled the kitchen light to its purest element. Good morning. What time does your shift start again? Oh, fuck off, Simone. She smiled, pleased. I have your plate, she said, and turned into the dining room. The door swung back violently, and then all I could see was his feet pounding the last few stairs. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so first of all, I, I just want to tell you that I'm very honored to be here and uh, wanted to explain a couple of reasons why I'm here uh, that might be surprising. Um, so last summer, 2015, my daughter had an internship with one of your editors, and she came home from work uh, one day, and she said, Mom, I have just read the best book, the greatest book. I, you're going to flip out when you read this book. And um, it turned out to be Sweet Bitter. Um, and uh, I then went on to read it myself. And of course, I thought it was wonderful and I enjoyed it so much. Um, uh, and I am not the only one. You have been getting incredible reviews. The New York Times called it brilliant, and the Washington Post said insists that it be savored. So that leads me to my first question, which um, obviously as a debut novelist, this has got to be, with reviews like you're getting, uh, like a once-in-a-lifetime experience, 
and I'm wondering how are you savoring this moment? I love that question because just you asking it reminds me to be grateful, which I think is going to be my answer. Um, but this is once in a lifetime. It's a very rare experience, first of all, to get a book published, then to get a book published with Knopf, and then to have it go out into the world and to be receiving love. I feel just like I'm a conduit of sweet, bitter love. And I'm also exhausted, and it's crazy and um, intense, and the schedule is brutal. But I come back to what a privilege it is to be able to write for a living. I was in restaurants for in New York City for nine years. And I, I went back to school with the idea to write this book. And I thought it would be published, but I didn't think that it would be anything like this. Mm. And that comes with its own complications, but it's also such a rare experience and so thrilling. And again, it's you have to just be so grateful that people are even reading your book. That never happens. I don't, I don't, I, yeah, I read a lot of books. I don't just don't know that many people that read books. Right. Well, um, well, they do. We no, do. I, all the people that we are here do. read books. And we really do when they're, when they're like this. We really do. So we're grateful that you wrote it. And, um, you know, speaking of writing, okay, so my first sort of section of questions is going to revolve around writing. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell us about uh, the writing process. Um, you, you just sort of said maybe a little bit to what I was going to ask, but which, which is, did you, did you know when you set out that, that you were writing this story, or did the writing of it lead you to it? Oh, that's a great question. What came first? Um, I had an idea for a female coming of age novel. Okay. Um, and I was working as a GM and beverage director for a restaurant group in New York City. And I, there aren't enough female coming of age novels. Again and again, we see the kind of male come to New York City to take on his destiny and reinvent himself, but you rarely see women do it. And I knew that I wanted to contribute to that category of fiction. And then I had this expertise in the restaurant industry. And I, so part of it is laziness. I didn't have to research anything. I, I That's going to eliminate like six of my questions. No, no. It's, it's not laziness. I, I take that back. Don't quote me. Um, but I, the two were tied together. And when I got into graduate school and I left my career, which was a very scary time, I, it came like a fever. And so it, I did have the idea first, but the voice came to me so completely. The first draft I ever wrote um, of this was a 25-page short story called Sweet Bitter, and it had the same first line and the same last line. Wow. It had the um, oyster scene, the truffle scene, wow. and it was a total mess. And my teacher was like, I was so excited. And she uh, was like, this is good, but this is not a novel. And I was like, what do you mean? It's a novel. Do you see? I wrote 25 pages. Um, <laughs> and it took a lot of work after that, but it definitely hit me. It, like, the writing of it took over. Okay. Um, so, but, but Tess, your main character, so it's not, you did work in service, but it's not autobiographical. Is it, that correct? Yeah, no, it is not autobiographical. The plot is to totally fictional, um, kind of borrowed from Henry James's Portrait of a Lady, um, which I was rereading this summer between my two-year program. But I did start with what I knew, and I don't know whether that's laziness or because I wanted to explore a specific moment in my life. I was once 22, and I drove over the George Washington Bridge, as my character does, and I came to New York, and I had a lot of experience. My character is a blank slate. I've been working in restaurants since I was 15. Um, but I fell in love with the restaurant industry. And I was hired at this incredible restaurant, Union Square Cafe. And it changed my life. And all of a sudden, this job that I thought would be temporary or would allow me to write was giving me a very full life. And wow. I didn't lack anything. And I continued on that path for so many years. So that experience of falling in love with the world and the 
kind of assault of color and taste and experience of being new in New York, that's all real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the characters and the plot are definitely fictional. It's more fun that way, I think. Right. Um, so I don't know if the, this is something you consider, but I felt like, OK, this is a great book. This is a great summer book. This is a great definitive New York coming of age book. It also, for someone like me reading it, actually made me feel like, wow, could I come of age at my age? You know, <laughs> like that reminding me to sort of be alive. I do feel like food and, and, and I don't know, the energy of, of the story made me question those, those things. Um, uh, I felt like it was an erotic book. Um, I felt it could be good for sexy book club. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, uh, but I wondered if you, do you, so I felt like it, it, the people that would enjoy this book covered a big, wide range. And I wondered if you consider when you're writing a book, do you think about who your audience is and who was it? I didn't. Um, going back to the first question, I didn't expect any of this to happen. And I was working frantically and kind of desperately. That was the moment I was in in my life. I really wanted to finish this novel in two years. But I had no concept of who I was writing for beyond I wanted to write a book that I would like to read. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because I'm supposed to be working on a second book now, and I do have a concept of audience. Oh, okay. And it's an entirely different experience to be thinking, well, when would this come out? And like, who would the reader, the ideal reader be? How can you touch multiple demographics? And I think it's because I'm in this like pr crazy press mindset with Sweet right. Bitter. Right. But with this book, I always thought it was so weird. I was like, this is such a weird book. No one's going to read this. Right, but right. Um, I knew that I wanted to read it. And I'm a reader first. So as long as I wasn't bored reading these pages over and over again, I assumed that someone else would be interested. Well, we definitely, definitely weren't bored. Um, <laughs> Sexy book club, um, though. What's that? Will you invite me? <laughs> I, yeah, I might have to start it, and this will be the, the first book. I'm telling you, there's some scenes. Um, uh, so as it being your first book, what was the, what was the editing um, process like? I mean, did you have to be flexible? Did you find the, the need or, or resistance to <clears throat> letting babies go or, you know, fighting the fight or how, how was that? It's tough because you are working on this alone in the dark and answering only to yourself for so long. And then you give it to a room full of people and they put their marks all over it. And you're like, you're insane. Don't touch that. <laughs> um, and so there was this um, dichotomy in me, this kind of like sovereign artist who would think to themselves, absolutely not. I'm not doing this, I'm not doing this. Um, and then there was this new girl who got this incredible publishing opportunity that I just really wanted for everyone to be happy. Right. And negotiating that, I grew up a lot, I think, um, and definitely came into myself as a writer, knowing when to push back and when to let go. And it's, you got, it's like your gut. There are certain, mm -hmm. like, just for example, like the character has no backstory. And ev at every step of the way, even in graduate school, every agent I met with, every publisher, they were like, so we're going to give her some backstory now. And I was like, no, we're not. No, we're absolutely not. Other things, like in the original draft, Jake and Simone, the characters that I just read, didn't appear until page 90. And they were like, you need to move that up to page 25. And which I was like, that makes a ton of sense. Like you uh -huh. are seeing some, you're seeing this more clearly than I can. Well, because um, you live with it, you know they're coming. Exactly. You're used to knowing that exactly. they're coming and we're not. Yeah, that's, that's um, an interesting point. Yeah, and so it's like it, it dealt the things you're willing to compromise on. Fortunately, I was in graduate school, so I fought with people about this book every week. <laughs> every, every single week, someone, new person would be like, that title. I'd be like, I don't want to talk about the fucking title. Like, just, <laughs> it's, that's the title. The title's non-negotiable. Yeah. And so I already kind of knew my non-negotiables going right. into the editing process. Well, I think, I mean, that's, 
the, it, it, life is like that too, you know, right. just learning, learning where you can push back and, and, and also how you can be open to somebody else having a good idea that you didn't think of. Absolutely. Um, uh, the, yeah. Um, the dialogue I find is so special and I noticed there were a lot of reviewers also that commented on how uniquely gifted you are at that. Um, I mean, the, the cadences of characters, the vernacular, just, it, it was just palpable. And I wondered if part of that was, did you know those people? Like, um, you know, the line is that the characters are all composites. There are some voices in there that are very, very real to me. Uh -huh. But one of the, um, the benefits of writing fiction is that I get to take everyone from every restaurant I've worked in since I was 15 years old and take their best lines. Right. Like I, um, I had so much freedom. And I wouldn't write things down while I was working. You hear these quips all night and the customers are saying weirder things than the servers most of the time. <laughs> um, no offense, customers. Um, Actually, that's funny. It did, there was a part of reading it because I consider myself a, a really big foodie. After I finished Desperate Housewives, I went to the Cordon Bleu for a year and studied, and um, I love, I consider it one of my life tasks to go to all the best restaurants, and I experience it. It's like my favorite thing to do. But reading your book made me, and so I've been on both sides. I've been in the kitchen at school. I've stodged in some very fancy restaurants. So not as much as you, but I do definitely know what it's like to be a server and a, and a, and a very bottom line, you know, kitchen helper, chef. So I've seen that and I'm interested in that, but, but it made me, this book made me panic about being a customer because, really good. because it makes as me, it should. as it should, <laughs> I, because it makes you feel like, what are they all saying? What are they all back there saying about whatever's happening at my table? There were some scenes where you had customers like crying or fighting or arguing with their spouse or whatever. And I thought, oh my God, that's what they do <laughs> when you do that. Don't do that. Don't. <laughs> um, it was, it was, yeah, it made me nervous to go to a restaurant. But uh, you were talking about the lines and I actually wanted to read you. That was, so, so twofold, there was this, yeah, I had some favorite lines that I actually had from the, the book that I just wanted to share with everybody. I mean, I, they don't, they're not in particularly any order, but they stuck out. One was, um, we can't unlearn things even when we know they aren't true. I just thought that was so That's incredible. That's a sad scene, too. Um, you think your life belongs to you, it doesn't. I, that, that, just huge. Like, how could this come out of someone so young <laughs> and beautiful? Um, he met my gravity with apathy and so began a free fall. I mean, just that's a good one. Oh my gosh! Oh, just well, that's a, I'll take just that. that was a really good one. <laughs> but you do this thing that you just you sort of just alluded to. She does this thing on um, quite a few times throughout the book, where you have a page or two where you're just listing uh, dialogue of random dialogue, and those were I think my favorite my favorite pages. Th those came up, and I just wanted those to go on and on. I was just riveted by that, and it reminded me, I sort of pictured myself on some busy New York street with like a tape recorder. If anybody still uses tape recorders, I guess it would be my phone. Um, and people like, people just busy walking by and like someone says this and someone says this and someone says this. And like you just picked out all the very, very best things and then lined them up on, oh, it's just, how did you come up with the idea to do that? I've never seen that before. Yeah, um, I love those passages. So thank you for noticing. They. Um so that very first draft, that 25-page short story, had the voice of, um, of Tess and the voice of Simone, and then it had what I was calling the chorus, which is, that people have the... called them poems before, but I think of it as a chorus of many, many voices. And my goal with that was to give the feeling of working a dinner service. So it's exact. I mean, yeah. it's exactly what you were talking about, where it's this total cacophony and confusion, and everything is a fragment and taken out of context and overheard, and no conversation is ever finished. Actually, maybe I'll read one of them. Yeah. I just am winging this now. Right, right, right. Well, that. I mean, that would be great. And and I know. And I was thinking too. Maybe it's 
time to for us to hear a second passage, if you would. Yeah, no, I don't. I um, know you were going to read the oysters. I which know, I, I was also going hear. to. You might have to like throw throw that. In. No, I think I'll read. Um, I think I'll read a chorus because it's so weird uh, and great. different. I love it. Um, okay, hold on. I really have never read these before. <laughs> the sardines are insane tonight. It's true, chef called him a faggot. HR is freaking out. Have you been to Sambar yet? No, the best Chinese is in Flushing. I'm playing a show on Wednesday. Scott is on fire. I was obsessed with Chekhov. I'm obsessed with Campari right now. I need to get my cameras out again. You know, I'm fairly well known in the experimental dance world. Table 43's industry, per se. If one more bitch cuts me off to ask for Chardonnay, if one more person asks for steak sauce, what the fuck? Carson's in again, without his wife. That's twice this week. Sometimes I think, fuck the pooled house. No, I'm not jealous. Technically, I texted first, but he responded. You don't get it. Yeah, I'm on day three. I feel great, high all the time. Will you water 24? Will you drop bread on 49? Move, fuck off, fuck you. It's like the rude Olympics in here today. No, they're just French. And after I took the LSAT, I was like, wait, I don't wanna be a lawyer. I still paint sometimes. I just need space. It's so hard in New York and time and money. Allergy on 61. It's not really romantic. I'd fuck the mom. Does she come in drunk? Yeah, it's just lemon, maple syrup, and cayenne. <laughs> it's just Nikki's martinis, never drink more than one. I just need representation. It's like banging against a brick wall. I need soup spoons on 27. Chef wants to see you now. I'm dropping soup now. What did I do? Fuck. The mid-course. Oh, so great. That, was, that kind of works. That's so great. That's fun to read. Oh my gosh, I just love kinda it weird. so much. Okay, so I had a couple food questions. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so reading your book made me want to drink more Riesling and eat more oysters. Um, <laughs> so I'm interested if uh, it, it was food, um, were you more interested in food as a result of your time in restaurants, or did you become even more interested as a result of, of writing this book? I was already living this life for right. so long, where food is kind of the lens with which you see the world and the way that you're paying attention, and you've studied food. Once you give it that kind of attention, it starts giving back to you all the time, and it really, it makes your life very sensual. and. I'd been living that way for so many years as a, a food professional. Um, I think the like least food obsessed I had ever been in my life was when I was writing this book because wow. I was back in school and I was waiting tables and I ate a lot of takeout and didn't shower that often when I was writing. Like, I, I used to have a life where I would go and eat at every single new restaurant as uh -huh. soon as it opened and um, I lived for it. but. Writing is kind of the opposite of that. You're in isolation and you're eating like a jar of cornichons for dinner and you're like, what happened to me? <laughs> <laughs> am I well? Wow. Is this like, is this $10 rosé? What am I do drinking? Um, and yeah, I, I think that separation, it needed to be recalled. I couldn't mm -hmm. have done both at the same time. So, so okay, so I didn't, I didn't realize you had had that much time in, in restaurants. So you're absolutely a foodie to the core. Yeah, so no, no East research. Coast oysters or West Coast oysters? I love salt so much. I love East Coast oysters. Okay. They're so briny and yeah, me salty. Too. Oh, good. Me too, but totally. I ha I've been, I was just in um, Seattle. Uh-huh. They have... You're not allowed to talk about East Coast, East Coast oysters. oysters in the north here. Um, there were some very good oysters. Okay. That's all I will say about that. All right. Some very good Washington oysters. And and your go-to wine? 
or is there such for, a thing? For when? For what, what are we so doing, yeah, right? Just, just if, just, if, so you're, so that's, you're a wine connoisseur enough that you could not just say to me, it has to be associated with, are we having a picnic? Are we eating pasta? Is it, are the, we, is it daytime? Is it daytime? Is it, is it nighttime? nighttime? Right, okay. Um, you know, I think, um, I think white wine during the day is a really lovely thing. I think it's one of life's great pleasures. And for that, it's usually like a muscadet, oh. something from the Loire, Loire Valley in France, something low in alcohol, really light that you can maybe make into a spritz if you want to, oh, okay. but very casual. What about you? What's your go-to? Uh, what is my go-to? Um, well, I will say once on it, because now, now I'm putting it someplace, I will say once one of my most memorable wine experiences my daughter's in the audience. I bet she knows what I'm going to say. Um, was uh, we did a, a family yacht trip in Greece, and I think I'm not kidding you. We we went through rosé like it yeah. was water. <laughs> it, it is water. And in it Greece. was, but the 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 context of just being out in the ocean and that that rose rosé was really lovely. That was fun. But yeah. I yeah, I don't know if I know enough about it to to be able to pick I'm, I'm like when I just go oh red I like red but I like white when it's hot you know yeah I'm a color person <laughs> yeah totally red, white you know I'll just drink it it's wine <laughs> but then that's what this that's what your server is there for but essentially your, but your book though made me want to go take a class in in wine you know to really understand the differences and it, it made me jealous that I didn't know that it was but I liked that part of the book because it made me actually feel like I was learning something. It was really important to me to write about wine in a serious way and not dumb it down at all and not worry if people were going to know which appellation I was talking about. Right. And, um, because it's authentic to the restaurant industry. These people are professionals and they are true gourmets and they know everything about every ingredient, which mountainside it comes from right. in the Jura and... The same is true of wine. And so I didn't want to slow down. This was actually with the whole book. People would say, don't you want to explain what a low boy is, which is a half refrigerator in a restaurant? And I was like, no, we don't have time for that. Like, people will get it. That's part of the jargon right, of being right. inside. Right. No, it made you really feel like you were there. I mean, yeah, definitely. Well, did you, did you, you know, after kind of stepping back from it, do you feel like there were similarities between the writing process and the cooking process? <sighs> cooking is just so much more fun. <laughs> um, it's not even comparable. Um, as far as uh, ingredients adding up to more than the sum of their parts, do uh -huh. you, the, yeah, the, do. Co the kind of final dish. The layering of a sauce, like yeah. what is the depth of flavor? you taste something and you don't realize all of the steps and all of the pieces that went into a veal stock reduction, mm -hmm. which has taken like three days to make. So um, there's something in that, that the book can be consumed with ease or, or people will say, I read it and I read it in a day and I'm like, okay, I read it for four years. <laughs> Every single day of my life, that's all I did. Um, there's something like that in cooking, but there's also something really gratifying in giving to people. Yeah in giving a gift to be consumed, whether it's a book or um, a roast chicken. It was funny, the first thing you, you said when you talked about savoring the moment and, and feeling the love of, of, that you're receiving and, and kind of wanting to give that back, and it reminded me um, of, I, I love to cook. I cook a giant uh, Chris, Christmas Eve dinner and Thanksgiving dinners, and I make pies all the, one of the things, now I will say, like, that's how I show people I love them. Like, that's, it's so, I make this one eggplant dish that takes so many hours to make that I finally called it my I must love you a lot eggplant casserole because <laughs> if, I, if I make this for you, it means I spent seven hours making something for you. And totally, and everyone wolfs it down in 20 minutes. 20, exactly, yeah. but that's, so that's, well, that's what we, we, will, we will have with that book. I feel like um, there was something else I wanted to ask you. Oh, no, it was about taste. Um, because you were just talking about taste, that that taste is such a uh, important part of the themes in 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 the book, and I was wondering if you felt like your um, sense of taste 
is the same as Tess's or, and, or different and how so? That is such a great question because people always ask me whether Tess is autobiographical, but they never ask me if she has the same like taste buds that I do. We're kind of similar. Oh, really? Yeah. I was thinking that maybe she would be more attracted to bitter than you were. No, I love bitter. But you know what was really hard is when I was writing this, I had been in the industry for so long, and I could not remember what firsts were like. And that ah, is something that I really wanted to capture with her. She's brand new. She's a blank slate, and it's her first oyster and her first sip of champagne. And I had grown so jaded, as we all do when we're in our industry for a long time, and reconnecting to that kind of delight of the first heirloom tomato which my story wasn't exactly like that, but when I got to New York City, I had never had like an heirloom tomato in peak season before. And it, it's like a different species than it a really supermarket is. tomato. Yeah, it really is. And that was the first revelation, the first food revelation for me, and so I gave that to her as well. I think, um, I think our palates are probably very, very close. How, do, how did you finally get back to the, the first... I mean, yeah, it was really difficult to to try to, I, people think I'm Tess, but I'm probably closer to Simone, the older, cynical server. Um, <laughs> well, actually, she's manipulative and scary. I was still, <laughs> I was still lovely. Um, but Catch you after your next book. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, it was really hard to remember what being 22 was like. First of all, because I was working in restaurants all the time, and I was drinking all the time and I was sleep deprived and struggling and I wasn't taking notes. Oh, and that was, and that was one of the things I meant to, no. I wondered if you kept a journal through all that time in restaurant service. It's funny cause I do, I, I handwrite in the mornings. Um, I do journal, but nothing of use. I went back, um, I was like, oh look, I have all these notebooks. I'm sure this will be so easy. And it was like, today's cloudy. <laughs> like, just awful. Like, I'm so tired. Like, books filled with I'm so tired. It's kind of the same thing right now. Um, <laughs> and, but music, music from that time would take me back and thinking about f f looking at photographs. And I collect old menus, like, from all of my memorable oh. meals. And so oh, that's cool. it was kind of, it was, like, thoughtless. Like, I just collect things. But then I was looking at them and it's such a moment in time in 2006 when they still had a filet mignon of tuna with wasabi mashed potatoes at Union right. Square Cafe. It's like such right. an 80s dish. It's terrible. Right. Right. Um, and it, they got rid of it shortly thereafter. Yeah. But things like that would take me back. And then I was never as innocent as she was, but I, that's when she really became a character. When I was like, she has no context. She's bringing nothing to the table. Everything is new to her. Wow. Um, and it was hard to write, but... But it made gratifying. it particularly, that, I guess that was the part that was the coming of age part, which is clearly for somebody that's that age, you know, reading it. But like even for me, it may, maybe that's what I was trying to say earlier was that it made, reminded me to find first. It, re right. it reminded me to live some things that I maybe haven't lived even, even yet. Um, uh, so, okay, so you, you, write the, you write the definitive coming-of-age New York story, and then what do you do? You move back to L.A. What's that about? <laughs> <laughs> so how um, are you finding L.A., and why did you do that? Get to, uh, <laughs> um, I, well, I'm going to start by saying I'm obsessed with Los Angeles. I moved here in January, and I'm extremely happy here. Um, I've been in New York for like two months, of course, for the, for the book, my life in New York was in really beautiful and full of food and wine. I was still, a year ago, I was still um, waiting tables. It was very beautiful, but very punishing. And it was 10 years of 70 hour work weeks and juggling multiple jobs and writing. And um, that was all fine, because I just could have taken a vacation and reset. But mostly I wanted to get away from where publishing was happening. Hmm. I found that once I had a book deal, I wanted quiet, that New York became very noisy in a different way with um, 
the chatter and the intensity of all the other writers that are around you. Mm -hmm. I think about it with actors a lot. I wonder about being in Los Angeles at the center of your industry and the kind of mental noise that it's, that produces. It's loud, and I yeah. think, and I think uh, you know, social media and 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 it, it's 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 difficult. It's loud. I think you hear people often figure out, you know, trying to figure out ways to escape, whether it's literally getting out or you know, mentally finding a way away from it. So yeah, I relate to that. Yeah, and I, I'm i from California, but I haven't lived here in a really long time. And I kind of created a little bubble for myself here where I feel really safe and I, I don't know that many other writers and I can try to think new thoughts, hopefully. Are you finding any great places to eat? <laughs> oh my God, where did I go? Um, John and Vinny's is so good. Oh, yeah. Have you yeah. been? No, I haven't been to the, the new one. I mean, I've been to Animal like yeah. a, a many years ago, but I haven't been to the John new one. John and Vinny's was really good. It. And uh, Crane and Pine in Silver Lake. Is that what it's called? Either. Pine and Crane? Uh, yeah. But I love Silver Lake. Fun, right? It's yeah. fun over there. Yeah, it's, it's such a great <laughs> Things have great. changed since I left when I was 16 years old. Ah, <laughs> yes, totally. Yeah. Totally. Well, so is it, time to maybe take some questions from the audience? Yeah, if anyone has a question, please raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you. Thank Just you. a quick reminder that questions at Live Talks LA generally start with a W or an H. They're short. There's no such <laughs> thing as a two-part question. And only Terry gets to ask follow-up questions. Ooh, yay. so many rules. Maybe it's the historic events of last night, but I was thinking when I was reading your book, which I loved, how much chatter there was about your, your advance. And I thought, I can't think of the last time I heard people talking this much about an advance if it was a male writer. And I wonder if that was your impression. Yes, that is my impression. Um, I think that there are a lot of ways in which people kind of diminish um, the work that women do, whether it's by assuming that it's all autobiographical or talking about the amount that they were paid, even though it was perfectly on par with what a male debut novelist at a major publishing house would have been paid, or whether it's by talking about the way that they look. I wish I could say that I'm more surprised by that, but I'm not, because that seems to be the cultural moment that we're living in. And I just try to keep my eyes focused on the pages and go forward. I try not to listen to the chatter. That would be a black, dark hole. <laughs> Hi, uh, Hi, nice to meet you, my name is Leo. I just have a question. Um, so you said you were in this industry for a while. Um, when did you actually decide to go study? Because it says you study a master of fine art writing. When did you decide that, okay, just writing is not enough, I had to study that? Was the idea about the story before already building in you? And how yeah. did you find time? Because you said 70 hours Yeah. A week. Um, so That's I was fully managing restaurants and helping to open businesses. And I was on the verge of opening a retail wine store with the group that I'd been working with, which was my dream in life and is still one of my dreams in life. And I was about to turn 30 and I had this panic when I was looking at spaces for the wine store that if I did not go back to school and write this book, it was never gonna happen. My life would just become more and more permanent and I would another 10 years would pass um, there were a lot of reasons, but it really felt like I was jumping ship and it was not, now it seems like it was all meant to be and it's so great because we're sitting here talking about my book, but at the time it was really scary. I knew that I needed an MFA program because I had to switch my mind completely. The 70 hour work week, when you're managing a restaurant, I mean, it's 24 hours a day and when you own restaurants, it's 24 hours a day. So going back to school and having two jobs and writing was actually a little bit, um, that was pulling back a bit. But I had the idea for the book. I thought I could finish it in the two years. 
I wouldn't have gone if I didn't think that I could finish with a novel. And so I left my career and my identity at that time, and it was very scary and foolish in a lot of ways, but we're here, so it worked. Do most people that go into a program like that, most of your classmates, do they come in with an idea? They don't. It, MFA programs I thought, are... I had, I had read that you talk, talked about that in, an, in another interview, and I, I didn't know if that was... Yeah, um, well, I think MFA programs are tough because they're really expensive degrees that don't give you a job at the end of it, so they're really hard to justify to any rational person. Um, <laughs> but we're at a moment right now when everyone's finishing college and just going straight into graduate school. And what I found with the 23-year-olds in my class was that they were really talented writers, but they didn't have their idea yet. Mm -hmm. They were still trying to find their voice. Mm -hmm. And I felt very lucky that I had already found my voice and could use that time just to develop a story. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to try five different short stories and a bunch of different characters, or maybe I want to write about Cuba. I was on, a, I was on track. Right, right. Um, so it worked. I do want to write about Cuba, but uh, not, not for a novel. Um, Have you been to Cuba yet? No, I'm dying, oh, I'm dying to go. I do some travel writing, either. and uh, I'm like trying uh, to like pitch stories. That's how I go places. I'm like, I'll write about it. <laughs> do you do other kinds of writing too besides travel writing? I write nonfiction, oh. some essays as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. Where do we look for those? Um, I had one in Vogue in March, and um, some places online like the Paris Review and Lit Hub. Oh, great. Yeah, they're personal essays. They're really um, dark. This is more fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, it just also made me think of um, when you said, and, and sort of your, your question about the, the um, advance also made me think, at the beginning you, you talked about um, caring about writing a female uh, coming of age story and, and it was a genre that was under underused or uh, um, underserviced. And um, I'm wondering as you are thinking of do, doing your next book, it, do you look at it from a point of view of, of trying to create another female um, role? That's a great question. I. Um I don't. I expl that, that was one of my goals with Sweet Bitter, and I feel comfortable th with the level in which I explored it, that kind of transition between girlhood and womanhood and this like point of extended adolescence of mm -hmm. 22 mm -hmm. when you're away from home and out of an institution and you really have your autonomy totally for the first time. I feel like I explored that moment intensely, and I'm kind of done with it at at this point. But I will always write about food and sex and women and the things that obsess me and interest me. Oh, food and sex and women. <laughs> <laughs> I like men too. You, you did just say that. Yeah. <laughs> and it's on record. Yeah. <laughs> I like, I, I, men are okay. I mean, they're, they're pretty interesting. Oh, okay, are there other questions? <laughs> There's one. Hi, you said you, um, obviously it took you a long time to develop your voice for the first book. Do you feel you have a voice for your second book or would oh it be similar God. or no, different? No, or? No, 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 we can't talk about the second okay. book. There's no second. <laughs> um, I would love to tell you something about book two, but I've been working on essays, which kind of suit my mind frame right now, which is short bursts of focus, and that's all I can really sustain. I still work for Sweet Bitter all day and all night, and it's been months, and it... Um, you know, I'm very grateful. It, it doesn't look like it's slowing down right now, but eventually it will, and I'll have the mental space to write a second novel. I have ideas and I have notes, but yeah, no voice yet. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> Not yet. Hi. Um, I just have a question in terms of rewriting when you get notes back from your publisher, classmates. How do you cope with that in terms of like, oh, like your inner voice? Do you start doubting yourself and just 
you know, how do you give advice to other writers? When I first, I'm like probably the worst person to ask about this. When I first got my edits back from my amazing editors at Knopf, I couldn't look at it for two weeks. I was away at a writer's residency. I was supposed to be like churning through my rewrite. Two weeks, I was just like, I hate this book. I hate everything about it. What have I done? Um, they hadn't even changed anything. It, they just made suggestions, but that it felt so intrusive and like mm -hmm. such a shift um, in my relationship with my work. And it's not just um, editing. There is something about receiving money for your work that changes your relationship to it. Someone has bought your book and they're invested in it and you're collaborating with them to make a work of art. And I, would, I will say it took me about two weeks but when I actually, I hadn't even read the notes. I'm just telling you like this, the visual of them on the page I couldn't handle. Um, when I read the notes, they were so in line with my vision for the book, which is how I know that I found the right people, that I found editors that saw me and saw this novel and weren't trying to turn it into Kitchen Confidential and weren't trying to make it more commercial, but wanted to retain its kind of, well, I call it its strangeness um, and its lyricism, which were really important to me. And that, that tru that's trust. Once the trust is established, the whole process becomes easier because you have allies. You're, you're writing new scenes and you can send them to someone that you trust and they're gonna give you honest feedback and some of it you'll discard and some of it will change, change the way you write. And so I think it's an incredible relationship. It was just, it was a real adjustment for me. And I don't know how it will affect book two because I'm, it's just totally different now. So um, a question about uh, the writing process. Did you, um, is it a certain number of words per day? Is it hours per day? Did you have a set routine? Would you go weeks without putting pen to paper, just thinking? What was that like for you? Yeah, no set routine. It's terribly inefficient. I, uh, I've, I write every day, but I really write in binges, kind of like how I used to work in the restaurant industry where you clock in for a 10-hour shift and you're done at 2 a.m. and you're like, what happened? I'm exhausted. Um, that was how my writing days were with this book. And even when I had time, even when I was at an artist residency with no structure, and I thought I would keep a schedule kind of, Virginia Woolf in her diaries ta always talks about how she wrote three hours in the morning, had lunch, correspondence for one hour, two hours, and then dinner. She did that six days a week. She had a day off and she was prolific. And I thought, oh man, when I quit waitressing, I am gonna be just like Virginia Woolf. I am not yet. <laughs> I still find that when I'm living, when I'm traveling and out drinking and gossiping and living my life, that's all I'm doing. I'm not recording it. Um, and then when I'm writing, I'm someplace else. I'm recalling it, and I need isolation for that. I haven't really integrated it yet. I would like to. Did you have uh, inspirations? Did you have mentors? Did you, I mean, what, what, what made you think you could write a book? Reading. I've been, I mean, I have been reading my entire life and I think that all writers are readers I first and you start out thinking, I'm gonna mimic this. I really like Sylvia Plath's poetry and I'm 13 and I'm gonna just nail this right now. And then you develop a sense of yourself as, as an artist or a writer, and you're like, I actually, maybe I wanna do this differently. Maybe I have my own voice or my own point of view. But I never wanted to be anything else. I did, I fell in love with the restaurant industry, but I went to undergrad for creative writing, uh -huh. and I wrote my whole life. I always knew, I th okay. think. Yeah, I did always know. And but teachers so were many so, so many mentors so many advocates for my writing i um i had kind of a troubled adolescence and i had a writing teacher that literally changed my life and got me into college and it's a very inspiring story that will make me teary and it's not for right now but 
um, every, every junction in my life, there has been someone to guide me and someone to help me. And what that's taught me now that I'm in a position where I can do that for other people is like, that's what keeps the system. That's what, right. that's what makes the community. Right. You have to be that guide to writers that are coming up as well. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you so yeah. much. Any more questions or? We'll make this our last question of the evening. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I did not know a lot about your book before I attended here. I read a, read a little bit about it and obviously learned uh, more tonight. Um, so when you think about a book about a woman coming of age, um, you think that it's a book that might have a lot more appeal uh, to women. Um, when I hear the conversation tonight um, about wine, about food, um, Harry can elaborate on some of the erotic sexual stories that are in the book <laughs> that I'm sure would have appeal to men. Um, do you think this book has more appeal to a woman? Um, and what is it about the book that you think, uh, I'm more intrigued by it, um, that would be appealing to men? And do you think it's appealing to both? Or does it sort of have an appeal to one sex or the other more? It's an interesting question because, and this isn't a bad thing, there are a lot of gender assumptions hidden, embedded within that about the types of book that books that men and women read, which is actually what the publishing industry runs on, is making those assumptions and making those categories and then making a pink book. Um, it's actually coral colored, um, very chic. I, um, I think that readers actually are genderless when they're reading, and I think that it's, they're responding to prose and they're responding to um, characters and plot. And I think that this novel appeals to men because it's, it's, I mean, it's a New York City novel, first and foremost. It happens to be a female that is our narrator, but she's navigating an urban environment and it's behind the scenes in a restaurant and um, it's loud and intense if men like those things. Again, the assumptions. Um, but what I think male readers are responding to is the writing, is the quality of writing and the, um, the rhythm and the voice. I think that regardless of gender, if you trust the voice, you can fall in love with any story if the writing's good enough, whether it's a romance novel or military nonfiction, women can fall in love with that. It really is about the voice. Yeah, and I, I want to just, I mean, I almost use the word apologize because I hope what I, um, I mean, there are some sexy scenes, but I, oh, I, yeah, it's I, about sex I, too. I, I, I didn't, I, I hope I didn't make you think that it was um, just a female book or a, uh, because the writing, and, and as evidenced by the reviews too, I mean, but the writing, is so artistic, it's so beautiful, um, so compelling. Uh, it, you know, it, it's, it's definitely not just a book for, yeah. for, for women. So I, I hope I no, didn't do anything to but make no, it, it seem is, that way. You know, it's, it was something that I, when I wrote the book, I was so aware of investigating women, so it is definitely one of the main topics of the book. Um, and I don't mind that. I don't mind that it's associated that way. Um, a book finds its readers no matter what, and it's because of the quality of the prose. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you for that question, though. Thank you, Terry. Oh. Thank oh. you, Stephanie. There you are. Thank you.